Today, I am glad to present Professor Roberto Ferrari who will be discussing the paradigm shift in heart failure treatment. <music> professor Ferrari is an emeritus professor in cardiology at the University of Ferrara. He was the past president of the European Society of Cardiology as well as the World Section of the International Society for Heart Research. He is currently the editor-in-chief of the European Heart Journal Supplement and editorial board member for many international peer-reviewed journals. This is Professor Ferrari, very happy to talk with you through P2P. Today, I will uh, go through the story of heart failure. Because you see, it is a long story. In the 50s and the 60s, heart failure was considered a kidney disease. It was explained with the back forward theories, and we were treating it with the diuretics, digitalis, and rest in bed. In the 60s, it became a cardiovascular disease. Inotropies and pre afterload the theory started to be popular, and with them the positive inotropes and the vasodilators. In the 80s and the 90s, heart failure became a neuroendocrine syndrome, and all these uh, anti hormone drugs has been used, and also physical training has been suggested as a form of therapy. So you see drastic changes because from a positive inotropies we went to beta blockers which are negative inotropics. From vasodilators to reigning angiotensin systems inhibitors and from resting in bed to the physical training. Then uh, we had uh, almost 10 or 13 years, which I called the dark year for heart failure treatment, because there were no real innovations. Uh, we considered the neuroendocrine activation very bad, and we recognized the needs to antagonize it. New drugs were generated, the mineral corticoid antagonist, the abyss, the renin inhibitors, but all acting on the neuroendocrine theory. And the guideline suggested, suggested what uh, I call a vertical add-on approach. The guidelines were telling us start with one drug, reach the maximum dose, and if that is not sufficient, add another one, and another one, and another one. So there was a sort of escalation of drugs. But then, in 2014, the heart failure treatment wakes up. And with that, we need to completely rethink the pathophysiology of heart failure. And that was because unexpected results from four new classes of drugs, which, curiously, they do not have anti-hormonal activity. These drugs are ARNI, the glyphosines, the soluble guanylate cyclase, and the omecamtiv mercabil. And with these drugs, several paradigms change has occurred. I'm sure you are very well, very well aware of the paradigm heart failure results. In this trial, Entresto was used, and the results were really incredible. And you can see on the right hand side of the slides that switching 1,000 patients from ACE inhibitors OAB to LGZ696 avoided really a lot of events. Why is that? because there is a new important target, and this target is neprilizine, which is inhibited by sacubitril. Now, neprilizine is an ubiquitous enzyme which is able to metabolize 
low molecular weight peptides, and some of these peptides are potentially useful in heart failure. And that is a real paradigm shift, a paradigm shift which comes from the paradigm study. Because you see, sacubitril by inhibiting neprilisin reduces the degradation and increases the availability of antinaturetic peptide, which actually exert positive effects. Antinaturetic peptide is a natural diuretic and vasodilators, and diuresis and vasodilatation increase is useful in heart failure. You see the paradigm. With ARMI, we are improving the good neuroendocrine response instead of blocking it. And for years, the antagonism of the neuroendocrine response was a dogma. I teach my student to stop it. This is no longer true today. And we are starting to talk about the delicate and, I should say, underestimated neuroendocrine balance in heart failure. You can see that in physiological condition, there is an equilibrium between what I call the bad hormones, which are the catecholamines, and the renin angiotensin system, which causes vasoconstriction and water retention, and the so-called good hormone, which is antinaturetic peptide and possibly other peptides causing vasodilatation and diuresis. In chronic severe heart failure, I'm afraid the bad hormones are taking over the good one, and there is a disequilibrium between the balance of the neuroendocrine response. Now, if you are using sacubitril, vasartan, or let's call ARNI, or let's call them entresto, then you can see that with the sacubitril, you will increase the antinaturetic peptide, therefore causing more vasodilatation and more diuresis. And with vasartan, you will reduce the negative effect of angiotensin II and all the activation of the reigning angiotensin system. And the final results will be a more physiological dilatation and a more physiological diuresis and the reconstitution of an equilibrium between the neuroendocrine response. So a very important paradigm shift. And then we experience the evidence from uh, the glyphosine, the so-called SGL2 inhibitors. I'm sure that you are very well aware of uh, the DAPA heart failure trial and the emperor reduced trial using either dapoglyphosines or empaglyphosines, and always very good results. And please notice that the curve diverge very, very early. These results occur independently from whether the patients were diabetic or not diabetic and independently from the ejection fraction. And this is important because the glyphosine are working not only in patients with reduced ejection fraction, but also in those patients with preserved ejection fraction. And once again, the emperor with the empaglyphosines and the liver with the dapaglyphosines. And once again, please notice that the curve are diverging very early. Why I'm saying so? Because this is the second paradigm shift, which um, comes from the early effect of uh, either the glyphosines or the sacubitil vasatan drug. And uh, that has caused a very fundamental question. And the question is, for the first time, we are asking for how long will my drug prolong my life? 
You see, this was not a question in the consensus one trial, when we look at the curve in a vertical way, because we know that the survival gain was for months. But with the paradigm heart failure and with the study with the glyphosins, the survival gain now is for years. And so we are looking also at the horizontal difference between the two curves. That has caused a real paradigm shift in the guidelines. Because before 2016, the approach was vertical. The emphasis was on dosage. Today, the emphasis is on prognosis. Before, we were suggested to add each drug on top of the others at the time. Now, we are told to use all the four active class of drugs together as soon as possible. Before, there was a long delay in reaching the target and in reaching the fully active treatment. Today, this delay is no longer acceptable. And that is the reason why we need to use four drugs at the same time. And uh, this has been named the Fantastic Four, which are, as you can see, the beta blockers, the mineral corticoid antagonist, the ARNI, and the SGL2 inhibitors. And if you are able to do so, in a 55 years old man, this approach may prolong life not for month, but for 6.3 years. And this is really something. The other paradox is with the glyphosines. Well, uh, we do not know how these drugs are acting. And actually, these drugs are acting independently from ejection fraction, independently from many things. We know some uh, unquestionable fact and one paradox. The fact are that the SGLT2 receptors are not expressed in the human myocardium. This is an important point because it means that these drugs at least are not acting directly on the myocyte. The improvement which we experience in the clinical trial uh, uh, is uh, happening in different pathologies in patients with diabetes or without diabetes, in patients with heart failure and in patients with the kidney disease. And the good effect and the good outcome is completely independent from the left ventricular ejection fraction. We know that uh, these drugs improve natriuresis, glycosuria, and osmotic diuresis. We also know that they call a small reduction in blood pressure, loss in calories and in body weight, and an initial GFR dip. And this is the paradox, because the early decline of hospitalization occurs when the GFR dip is still ongoing. And this paradox resembles to me the paradox that we are experiencing with the beta blockers. When we are using a beta blocker, at the beginning, the ejection fraction is reduced. And only after months, we can experience an improvement of ejection fraction because of reduction of remodeling. That reduction of ejection fraction is important in terms of oxygen consumption. And the oxygen is very important also for the kidney. And it is possible that this early decline contributes to the good effect of the glyphosines. Now, people have been trying to explain the effect of glyphosines by a metabolical improvement through uh, more glucagon activation and through a switch 
from glucose to free fatty acid. Also, people think that there is a reduction of the epicardial adipose tissue, resulting in less adiposeness. Other people think that there is a reduction in blood pressure and of the intravascular pressure. That causes less worse stress and improvement in pre and after load. Other group believes that there is a reduced sodium hydrogen exchange and therefore a better calcium handling and therefore a better diastole. Other people believe that there is less oxidative stress and a better endothelial function or less endothelial dysfunction. Others do believe that NADPH oxidase is important to the effect and that causes more nitric oxide activity and other people think that the effect is on uh, the mitochondria with the suppression of uh, uh, with more autophagy and the preserved mitochondria function. Well, all this hypothesis has been proven in experimental animals, but none has been really proven in human beings. I personally do believe that the uh, SGL2 inhibitors cause glucose excretion and natriuresis that result in less plasma and particular interstitial volume, a sort of uh, uh, a, a sort of hemodilution in uh, pharmacologically, and that uh, causes uh, a sort of ultrafiltration-like effect, which I believe is very important. Then the other class of drugs, which are still under evaluation, and therefore they are not put it together with the magnificent four, is Vericiguat. I'm sure. All of you remember the very good Victoria trial showing a reduction of mortality and hospitalization with Vericiguat, very importantly in severely heart failure patients. And so these drugs can be an opportunity when the ejection fraction is really uh, severely reduced or when the patients exert severe heart failure. The mechanism of action, once again, is uh, totally different uh, from neuroendocrine, uh, anti-neuroendocrine activity, and it is related to an increase of cycle GMP, which causes vasodilatation, inhibition of platelet aggregation, anti-remodeling, anti-apoptotic, and anti-inflammatory effects. And finally, the Galactic uh, trial has shown the effect of emacanthive uh, Mercabil, which is uh, a calcium sensitizer. Uh, this uh, study did not show a, an improvement of cardiovascular death, but just some reduction in hospitalization. But what is important is that uh, is a calcium sensitizer and uh, as you may recall, all the positive inotropic agents failed, and at least omecantib mercabil did show some good effect in terms of hospitalization in severely, um, in severely uh, affected patients. Because you see, looking at uh, different subgroups, it is possible to see that uh, if there is no other fibrillation, and if the median level of uh, ejection fraction is below 28, it seems that there are positive effects. So, in conclusion, in 2020, heart failure cannot any longer consider the neuroendocrine disease, but I should say a multifaceted syndrome. And uh, we can act on the syndrome by using antineuromonal drugs or by using ARNI and restoring the delicate equilibrium between the neuroendocrine activation. We can also act on the endothelium with the guanylciclase modulators, and we can act on the kidney by using the SGT2 inhibitors 
And indeed, we can act on the myocardium with the omecantive mercabil and indirectly also with the beta blockers because they do improve they do improve ejection fraction and reduce remodeling. And therefore, the ability is uh, on us, on us doctor, to identify the best drug for the more relevant target. And of course, by using all these targets together, we might have uh, the best of the effect. Now, in conclusion, Drugs therapy is essential in heart failure and has substantially improved. Today, there is a clinical evidence of benefits which is still looking, at least for some drugs, for scientific explanation. Such a pragmatical approach will contribute to the better understanding of heart failure. And I like to put to you that the evolutionary understanding a syndrome which constitutes the end of the majority of the cardiovascular disease, and unfortunately we do not know when it starts, it is what makes our profession challenging and fascinating. And this is my last message to you. You are definitely I'm sure fantastic doctors in treating heart failure, but always try to understand why you are so successful and which is the physiopathological approach uh, that you are counteracting with your drugs. That will make your profession very, very interesting. Thank you very much indeed. Dear peers, if you have any interesting or even controversial comments, please feel free to post them or email them to me at kol at p2pmd.net. I will reply to these comments in a special Q&A video next month. Please take 10 seconds to learn how you can be more than just a spectator at P2P. Right now, tens of thousands of healthcare professionals are actually watching this video. You may take this opportunity to post your own cases, best practices, and research data in the comment box underneath the video. So, don't miss out on this chance to make your work known to global peers. If you have any captivating insights that you would like to share with your peers, Please email your thoughts to kol at p2pmd.net. Here at P2P, we welcome collaboration with the brightest minds on the planet.